The newest iRacing season just started, and here are the release notes. Hidden in here is a little snippet about fixed foveated rendering being introduced by the iRacing dev team within OpenXR deployment of iRacing. But it's a little more than that. It's actually quad view technology that's being implemented. Now, I'm not a developer, so I can only describe this at a high level. Going back to the fundamentals, the way a VR headset works is it's going to present a slightly different image of the virtual world to your left eye and to your right eye. This stereoscopic rendering tricks our lizard bro uh, brain into thinking we're looking at a virtual world instead of LCD screens right in front of our face. If I try to overlap these two images, I can show you just how different the perspective is. I've lined up the red car in front of us, but look how different everything else is. Without optimization, features, this means two completely different scenes have to be drawn. If I put that into motion and we run left and right eye, you can imagine how difficult this compute and render workload is. The CPU having to provide two different instruction sets to the graphics card to render the scene twice. So nine years ago, Nvidia introduced simultaneous multi-projection and single pass stereo, or as we know, SPS. This allowed the developers to submit one single scene and it will then create a second instance for the other eye. So the CPU only instructs the driver once and the GPU only does the geometry once, but we get two images. Now, a couple years after that, Nvidia came out with multi-view rendering. This is an expansion of SPS, just providing more flexibility and options to the developers. Now, four viewpoints can be done in a single pass, so the fetching and shading of geometry only occurs once. This also gave Nvidia cards native driver support for canted displays. Multi-view rendering enables a wider field of view. So it's upon this foundation that iRacing has deployed foveated rendering. This technique reduces the render quality on the periphery while having it crystal clear in the middle. This is my approximation of where it's at. If you look down the road at the cars in the distance, the texture of the fence, the sand, things like that, you can see the reduction in clarity. You might be thinking, dude, this is nothing new. We've had OpenXR toolkit for years and you've been able to deploy this. Yes, this is true. And that is a way to reduce GPU workload. But the difference with iRacing FFR is when it occurs inside the render pipeline. iRacing is deploying this at a deeper, lower level. So it's occurring earlier in the render sequence. If we're talking cake, OpenXR Toolkit is like a scoop of icing that you can add on top, but iRacing FFR occurs at the foundation upon which everything else is built. And the creator of the toolkit has said as much. The best VR optimizations have to come from the developer. Using third-party tools to turbo that or crop this those are all workarounds. And what's most exciting about this optimization from iRacing is that it's going to set our expectations. A new bar has been set for VR implementation with sim racing. And we, the customer, are going to benefit by this because now the competition has to follow. Oh, it's also possible that iRacing has mixed up some other ingredients for further optimization, but we don't have transparency on that yet. Okay, so how about some benchmarks? All of today's testing was done at Zanvort with this replay. And if you want to see everything in one bar chart, here you go. Using my Pimax Crystal Light, I have the resolution set at 0.75 in Pimax Play. That's a render resolution of 3232 by 3824. In white, we see the multi-view rendering with the iRacing foveated rendering. Blue is this season's SPS. And orange is just from my previous testing which you can see in more detail here, including uh, the iRacing graphics and stuff like that. This chart represents the average GPU frame time during this one lap benchmark, and we see big gains. The 5090 saw its frame times reduced by 21%, the 5080 by 34, the 4080 Super by 35, the 3080 Ti by 32, and finally the 3060 Ti by 46%. The SPS performance from season two is at the bottom, but there's nothing noteworthy. I think we really have to look at the frame time histogram charts to appreciate the gains. The best example is probably the 3080 Ti. In 2025, this GeForce delivers mid-range capabilities. 
multi-view rendering has completely shifted our GPU render times to the left of our 90 hertz line, which is at 11.1 milliseconds. We go from a stuttery, difficult to drive scenario of about 20% on time to 100% on time and 90 FPS. Using iRacing's FFR completely transforms the VR experience. Now is a good time to talk about the FFR values I used for the benchmarking. I, I went with default. And here's the side-by-side -side showing the best quality versus the worst quality and default at the top. You have to manually adjust these settings within the renderer DX11 OpenXR INI file found in your iRacing documents folder. With a Pimax Crystal Light, I cannot see the uh, image degradation with running 50-50 compared to SPS with no foveation or foveation? Anyways, so in future testing, I'll probably use that, but for now, all these results are with 3540. Okay, so let's go back to the group shot. And another way to showcase this data is with the histograms. Now, I can't put all the data on the chart at once. It's just a disaster, but here's everything with SPS. The green data for the 4080 Super shoots way up the chart, but I'm, I'm not going to scale it to include it much like the gold 3060 Ti to the far rate that which displayed frame times well above 30 milliseconds. Now watch how dramatic the shift is when we enable MVR and the FFR rendering. This swing in results, it's, it's a game changer, guys. It's crazy. So you might be looking at this and the white 5090 and be thinking, wow, you know, that gap is really closed down. Why, why isn't the 5090 doing better? Well, let me bring in the CPU frame times. And uh, yeah, uh, the 5090 can't really go faster. Um, it's limited by the CPU generating the work for it. And in this case, th that's as fast as the 9800X3D goes. And this does bring up an important discussion point. I did measure a slight bump up in the average CPU frame time running MVR compared to SPS. And the season three build is slightly more intense on the CPU compared to season two when I was testing SPS. These data sets aren't as accurate as I would like them to be, but it's hard to deny that trend. I'm using a 9800X3D. It's basically the fastest processor a consumer can buy for gaming. So I wonder if say a six core processor from five years ago would fare the same, and I'm guessing it would fare much worse. If you are already pushing your CPU to its limits, MVR could now push it over the edge, especially after these season three updates. I shared this theory on the iRacing forums and a user replied with his FPS VR results, showing in the top regular old SPS and in the bottom MVR results. And we can see that the light blue line representing the CPU definitely shifted to the right and he actually had a worse, more stutter prone experience. Speaking of Steam VR and CPU frame times, here's a chart comparing that. If you look in the top right, the average CPU frame time was better with OpenXR Toolkit compared to Steam VR, and SPS offered a slight advantage over uh, MVR. This testing was done with a 5090 and 9800X3D. And I also collected the GPU frame times, comparing the two MVR results with iRacing's F. FR, I guess it was a bit surprising to see that um, using the Pimax OpenXR runtime uh, didn't really provide much of an advantage compared to SteamVR. That's not the case with uh, SPS, where SteamVR actually has slightly worse performance. I'm not sure what to make of this, I just thought I would share. I also did some testing with an RTX 2070, 8 gigabyte, and I have those results with a 3060 Ti. This was captured at 0.5 render resolution in Pimax Play, which is the lowest resolution at 2156 by 2552. Once again, we see some big gains. I mean, we take the 2070 from orange with SPS and it shifts to blue with MVR, but a lot of its frames are still late and we'd have to reduce a lot of graphics quality to try and make that up. When it comes to bugs, I did experience a loading error with a 3060 Ti on occasion where it would just get stuck. I've seen a few users report of getting like no render at all, like black screens. 
Some users have also noticed that SSR reflections aren't working properly with MVR enabled. And I've seen some complaints that the pixelation to reduce the render resolution and reduce the workload, that it's just too pixelated, that they can't see anything, it's unusable. And I was actually able to reproduce that one. When I first went to capture this footage, I actually had OpenXR Toolkit opened and I was using SteamVR as my OpenXR runtime to operate the Pimax Crystal Light. When I did that, it actually looked like this. Image quality took a nosedive. And I don't have any OpenXR Toolkit settings applied. It's just running stock. So there's some kind of conflict happening here. So my advice to those users is to disable OpenXR Toolkit and other uh, layers you might have active. I don't think the issue is related to Steam VR, but I'm not going to investigate this further. We have hot fixes and patches coming. And I suppose I should mention Radeon. While this current deployment of iRacing's uh, MVR is using the NVIDIA stack, it is possible that the new render engine, when it comes out, could possibly offer this with Radeon cards. I'm not holding my breath on this, but there's reason to be optimistic. Yeah, so that's uh, it for now. I want to give a shout out to Greg for his super thanks and our latest Patreon member, Strange Loop. <laughs>